circumstances like we're facing today to uh, wake us up a little bit, give us a little bit of an alarm, you know, buzzer going off in our head that, ah, this is something we need to pay attention to. And there are reasons why we should pay attention to it, reasons why we should think seriously about it and prepare ourselves. And um, so I want to submit to you that what we see in the American Revolution is really, really critical, really, really important to how we think about a political theology or a theology of Christian resistance today and learning from our forefathers in the way that we'll hear some overview of today is helpful as we consider what we should do in our own day. And I was telling my brother here a minute ago, you know, reading um, about this uh, over a period of weeks and a lot this week, you know, um, has charged me up. <laughs> it's got me fired up, you know, to, to want to be more faithful to the Lord in this area, uh, more faithful in our generation. And I want to say it was, um, it's attributed to Martin Luther, um, but there was uh, somebody else who originally said that if uh, persecution, essentially the, 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 the quote is summarized this way, if persecution or if the war against Christ's kingdom is taking, um, is taking place most heatedly, most forcefully in one particular area, and yet the people of God or a Christian is fighting or waging the battle in some other area, no matter how fiercely he fights in that area, he simply cannot consider himself faithfully because he's not fighting. In the, you know, I, I can't remember exactly how the quote goes. I'll see if I can find it. But essentially, we need to be waging our spiritual warfare um, where the forces of darkness, as it were, are most fiercely arrayed against the kingdom. Uh, in order to be faithful in our generation, that's where we need to be fighting. So, you know, so we, we come to subjects like this then um, in uh, our Christian lives where we need to consider uh, what the Bible says, consider how we are to respond, and make sure that we're responding faithfully. And I'm, you know, even as we move through this series, already beginning to think and, and maybe put some ideas together for us as to how we should uh, respond and what we should be doing and how we should be thinking. And we're going to be talking about those in coming weeks. We're getting close to wrapping up this part of our study. In part one, we're dealing with Leviathan rising, if you remember, and government encroachment, the Christian's relationship to the state, talking about those things. In part two, we're going to get to social justice issues uh, and what has become the Marxist moralistic religion of this new movement. And we're going to talk about that in part two and probably do six, seven weeks on that particular subject before we move on to something else. So uh, today we come back to a theology of public life, a Christian resistance in the American founding. In tracing the development of political the uh, theology from the early church to the Reformation and then beyond the Reformation into uh, the political upheaval that characterized the 17th and 18th centuries, uh, we've now arrived at the application, if you will, of that developing theology in the American Revolution, American colonies, uh, and the application of a theology of Christian resistance in particular, and in part that led to an American Revolution, uh, and how that theology of Christian resistance um, develops into um, uh, a theology, if you will, of self-defense. So not just Christian resistance, but we see it develop even further in the American colonies to uh, self-defense. We'll talk about that a little bit this morning. Uh, it becomes really important to how we conceive of our own theology. Uh, last week, we considered a very brief overview of the reasons for resistance in the colonies. If you remember the, that brief history of sort of how that resistance started and why. And then we looked at the overlapping biblical and constitutional. Those things are overlapping because our constitution is founded upon biblical principles. So we see in the, in the arguments of the colonists, uh, both a biblical and a constitutional argument that are overlapping, right? And that, those are biblical and constitutional arguments for resistance. We have a biblical warrant we also have a constitutional warrant to resist tyrannical and oppressive uh, government. In this case, the rebels, those who were in violation of Romans chapter 13, were those in the English parliament who attempted to exert an authority in the colonies that had not been given to them. They were given no jurisdiction, they were given no authority, and yet they wielded, attempted to wield an abusive, oppressive, tyrannical authority in the colonies that had not been given to them. 
Um, they went outside of their jurisdiction. And we talked about how that related to the third reason for Christian resistance. Christian resistance for three reasons. I want to remind us of these things so we can sink them into our heads because they become really important, okay? Christian resistance is warranted under Romans 13 when civil authority commands something that God forbids, when civil authority forbids something which God commands, and when civil authority acts outside of their jurisdiction, exercising an authority that does not belong to them, uh, encroaching upon the authority of another, right? A third, that third basis for Christian resistance. In this case, um, that third basis was challenged by the English parliament attempting to, um, against the charters given the colonists by the king himself, uh, took it upon themselves to begin um, taxing, not just taxing, but oppressing uh, the colonies. Two very important points that I want us to think about this morning. First, it's important for us to remember that this Christian resistance uh, that led up to the American Revolution didn't take place in spite of the scriptures or to the neglect of the scriptures. This Christian resistance took place in the American colonies because of the scriptures, all right? Uh, the Bible provided the foundation, provided the basis on which the American colonists resisted uh, tyranny uh, in the colonies. Men are given unalienable rights by God. By this point, unalienable rights are entrenched in the thinking of the colonists. Rights to life, rights to liberty. Back then, a right to property, but in particular, a right to pursue virtue. You, you, damaya, <laughs> you, damaya. It's like, do you know me? Thank you. Um, I need to get that word under my belt. Um, the right to pursue uh, virtue, what was translated happiness by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, but unalienable rights given to us by God that we should not easily forfeit. These rights are to be defended. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Do not become slaves. And so they decided to stand and resist. Chiefly, all of this due also to a covenantal view of government, a covenantal view, if you will, of Romans 13, um, versus an absolutist view of Romans 13. I think the, you know, the absolutist view of Romans 13 really pretty easily refuted, right? We don't owe absolute obedience to civil authority because civil authority does not have, is not an absolute authority. It's a limited authority. So when somebody says, listen, you got to obey Romans 13, you know, uh, be subject to civil authority. To resist them is to resist the ordinance of God. Well, it's very easy to undermine the foolishness of an absolutist view of that text by saying one thing. What happens when the civil authority commands something that God forbids? Or what happens when civil authority forbids something that God commands? And we see examples of that all over Scripture, right? All over Scripture. Paul is stating a principle there, and it's important for us to remind ourselves of the principle. So, it didn't, the, the American Revolution didn't happen um, apart from the scriptures or in neglect of the scriptures. It happened uh, in large part because of the scriptures. And I want you to hear from um, some theologians of that time period uh, in their own words. And when you get to the American Revolution, it's fascinating when you start reading that and studying that because we start to get into um, theologians that we're well familiar with that are writing extensively at this time period. You've heard the name Gilbert Tennant. Gilbert Tennant wrote extensively during this time period about Christian resistance to tyrannical government. Uh, Cotton and Increase Mather. Uh, Karen and I were talking about them on the way to church this morning, how uh, Cotton and Increase Mather, both dealing with uh, tyrannical encroachments of civil authority and a pandemic, a pandemic at the time, right? Dealing with inoculations um, and people at war, if you will, over whether inoculations uh, should be biblical, should be allowed or not allowed, and very wise people like Gilbert Tennant, like Increase Cotton Mather, taking the position that these things are Christian liberties and explaining how that works. Very helpful. Um, George Whitfield writing about these things. So uh, we get into names during this time period that are very familiar to us. Okay, turn to Romans 13. Romans 13. I just want to give us a quick review, right? Bear with me. Quick review. To have this text in your mind, as we hear from colonial pastors who are writing against governmental tyranny, all right? I want, we want to have this text in our minds, thinking about it, brewing on it, as we um, listen to their, their own words, okay? Verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, 
For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Verse 1, where, where all governments instituted by God are accountable to God for how they govern. There is no authority except for that authority that is um, delegated by God, derived from Apart from accountability to God, or apart from uh, having been specifically delegated by God, that is a uh, satanic, usurping, fake, counterfeit form of authority, right? Uh, the only authority that exists is an authority that is derived from, delegated from God. All other authorities are um, fake, are satanic deceptions, are worldly deceptions, okay? That's the way they began to think about this. Um, governments are instituted by God. Those governments are accountable to God. That means that their authority is limited. And if their authority is limited, then our obedience to them is limited. Do you see? Right off the bat in verse 1, there is no absolutist view of Romans 13. Uh, it's a covenantal view of Romans 13. Governing authorities, civil authorities, have responsibility in covenant with God, the one who gave them that authority, to exercise their authority in keeping with the ordinance of God, okay? Let every soul be subject to governing authorities because there is no authority except from God, and the author that means all those others are not authorities from God, they're from some other source, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Verse 2, therefore, whoever resists that authority Resist the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Their authority is to be exercised in harmony with the ordinance of God, okay? Such that to resist their authority is to resist the ordinance of God. But what happens when their authority runs contrary to the ordinance of God? We're not resisting the ordinance of God then. We're resisting some tyrannical, oppressive counterfeit, you see? Um, that's not the, the authority that God had delegated to them. Uh, if you resist, um, in other words, when civil authority runs contrary to the authority of God, uh, that usurping sinful approach to authority should be resisted. Make sense? Uh, because it's not running in harmony with the authority. Let's think about it in the way that they did. <clears throat> they thought about that authority much the way that we would think about the authority given to a pastor, an elder in a church, or much the way that you would think about the authority of a husband in his own household. What happens if I, <laughs> or Pastor Jerome, Pastor Dale, if we lose our minds and start running off the rails, coming up with stuff for us to do <laughs> that isn't biblical? Well, listen, the Bible says you need to submit to your elders. It gives no qualification about that. You need to do what your elders say. And by the way, you can't go anywhere. You can't leave because your elders say so, and you are to submit yourself, right? If you, took, if, if you took an absolutist view to any other passage in Scripture where submission is commanded to authorities put in place by God, you're going to wind up in the same hot water, aren't you? At some point, what about the, the submission of a wife to her husband? If her husband becomes oppressive, becomes um, not ruling in harmony with the ordinance of God, but becomes uh, abusive in his exercise of authority. What happens to a wife's submission? I think a wife biblically, biblically has biblical warrant to resist that unbiblical exercise of authority with the tools that the scriptures provide for her, which of uh, one is uh, Matthew 18, right? To stand opposed to an unbiblical exercise of authority. There is no absolute authority on this earth other than God. Jesus Christ has said, all authority has been given to me, okay? So the, the colonists, um, the Puritans, the reformers, thought of authority as something that is delegated by God, derived from God, and therefore should be exercised in accord, in harmony with God's ordinances, God's law. And when those authorities run contrary to God's law, those authorities should be resisted, okay? And resisted as sinful, as satanic, as something that is harmful to you or to other people, right? Those things should be resisted. Um, verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. And what happens when they become a terror to good works? And they embolden evil, right? What happens then? 
Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. You will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. It was Jonathan Mayhew preaching a sermon where he said, are you actually going to call these um, wicked, deplorable um, authorities like Nero? Are you going to sit, sincerely sit there and call Nero God's minister for good? No. <laughs> Uh, Nero is a wicked satanic counterfeit, is the way that they would have thought about that. Uh, those who are wielding an authority in accord with God's word are the ones who are God's ministers for good. So you have uh, authorities in the world that act in wicked and sinful ways. They're not God's servants in that sense, acting in wicked and sinful ways, um, exercising authority that's been delegated by, them, by God. They're exercising a counterfeit authority. Uh, they're usurping the authority that God has given. Now that's different from saying... Um, the Assyrians are the rod of my anger. That's a different situation altogether. God using sinful and wicked nations to bring about his ends. God would still depose the Assyrians because they have sinfully wielded authority in their own country, just like God deposed Nebuchadnezzar for the same reason, right? Look at all that I have done by my hand. All right? God would still depose those, although God is sovereign using their sin even for his own good purposes. It's a different thing than to say, um, we're going to pass a law that is uh, going to allow for the murder of babies, and that is acceptable because we are God's ministers for good. Right? That's, that's an absolutely atrocious, hypocritical, ridiculous, absurd, absurd thing to assert. And so those that would say, well, we need to obey the civil authorities, right? Abortion is legal in our country. We need to obey the civil. Yeah, you don't understand Romans 13, and you don't understand what's being spoken of here. Um, he is God's minister for, to you for good. This one, this authority described in Romans 13 is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. This is the, the principle. Right? This is the way that it should be. When wives are commanded to submit to their husbands, uh, Paul assumes godly husbands who are pursuing the Lord's ends, the Lord's cause. Right? When uh, Christians are commanded to submit themselves to the elders, the principle assumes elders who are acting in accord with God's law and pursuing God's purpose, God's cause. Does that make sense? And when they don't, they exercise an authority they've derived not from God. They've derived it from out of their own flesh, out of the heart of their own imagination, from someone else. Uh, it is a usurping, um, oppressive, tyrannical. That's the definition of tyranny. It's a tyrannical form of authority. Civil authority, from Romans 13, is that authority that is to praise to give praise to that which is good. It's to be a terror to that which is evil. He is to act as God's minister for good uh, to the governed, for the good of the governed. They're not to act in self-serving ways. They're not to um, act for his own self-interest. He is to be God's servant, God's diakonos, his deacon, with the sword against evil, not using the power of the sword to do evil. When he uses the power of the sword to do evil, he is tyrannical, he's abusive, he's not from God in that sense. It is to that civil authority, described by the text, Romans 13, that we are to be subject, that we're, to com that we're commanded to be subject. When civil authority acts in ways contrary to that, that's when Christian resistance becomes... Um, becomes something we talk about and becomes something that the uh, um, Christians in history have dealt with and talked about, and we're going to see that in the American Revolution. In other words, Paul communicates the principle of submission to higher power, particularly civil authority here, in much the same way that he communicates submission to other authorities, namely elders or husbands, um, and those don't have absolute authority. The text does not teach absolutism. text does not teach um, absolute submission to an absolute civil authority. Um, simply doesn't do that. This all led to, right, that understanding of Romans chapter 13 leads to a distinction then between a covenantal view of government and an absolutist view of government. Remember the covenantal view of government, two covenants at play. One, a covenant between God and rulers and people, right, on one side. The other covenant between rulers and the people, right? Um, so two covenants in play with a covenantal view of government. Consequently, then, a distinction between the covenantal view of government and an absolutist view of government 
um, led to a distinction between resistance and non-resistance views of Christian resistance or, or civil authority, right? Resistance and non-resistance views. Uh, there was actually a view that was uh, popular under the divine right of kings uh, called passive obedience, which meant that if the king, um, if the king or the ruler um, decreed some law that a Christian in good conscience could not obey, the Christian had to uh, render passive obedience to God, which means that he couldn't do anything about it. He simply had the only option of doing nothing. He wouldn't obey the king. He would not, against the king, obey God. His only option was to sit back and do nothing. It was called passive obedience. <laughs> and um, that way he wasn't usurping the authority of the king under divine right of kings. And God would deal with the whole mess later under judgment. <laughs> um, just a foolish um, application of that absolutist view of Romans 13. All right. From Gary Stewart's book. This is a book I highly commend to you, um, reading it this week. Uh, Gary Stewart, Justifying Revolution. It's the American Clergy's Argument for Political Resistance, 1750 to 1776. Excellent book, really good overview, very helpful. And you hear from the words of uh, pastors and um, uh, Christians alike in um, New England at the time before the re and after Revolutionary War. Listen to this from um, Elisha Williams. Elisha Williams was a rector at Yale from 1726 to 1739. Um, Elisha Williams, interestingly, was a mentor or a discipler of Jonathan Edwards. So there's a connection there for us. An, absolute, an absolutist reading of Romans 13 serves the designs of arbitrary power for erecting a civil tyranny over a free people. Right? If you have that absolutist view of Romans 13, then it serves a usurping tyrannical power in attempting to erect a tyranny over a free people. Williams argued that it is necessary to distinguish between the powers which are not pretended powers, usurpers, and the powers which are powers that are of God and acting according to his ordinance. One is to be in subjection to the powers that are truly of God and God's ordinance, while one owes no submission to the powers that are not. Right? You can see that view of Romans 13 um, in application in the thinking there of Williams. Listen to Williams. He goes on. If the higher powers for the administration of the state rule not according to that constitution, that covenant, if you will, between God and the rulers, or if any king thereof shall rule so as to change the government from legal to arbitrary, and what he means there is by... Um, removing God's law, removing God's ordinance as the basis for which they govern. In other words, making it arbitrary now. You have no objective basis on which you govern. Laws, you're passing laws arbitrary. Um, it's no longer, there is no longer an objective basis for morality, an, object, an objective basis for law. That's contained in the scriptures alone. And when you remove that basis, government becomes uh, arbitrary he says, the power from God fails them. In other words, they're no longer the authority, as it were, that is established by God, instituted by God. They're now a usurping authority, a rogue authority, if you will. It is then a power not in this text, Romans 13. And so no subjection is due to it by this text. A power that is no better than a pretended one can't challenge any obedience by virtue of this text. In other words, a power running contrary to God's ordinance, a civil authority doing that, can't come to this text and say, you owe me obedience. Can't say that. Why? Because he's not acting in harmony with God's law. He's not acting in accord with the Lord's ordinance, his mandate for ruling. Um, so it goes to show you the absurdity, right, of an absolutist view of Romans 13. If that authority, if that power acting arbitrarily according to its own rules, its own thoughts, wishes, that power is no better than a pretended one and can't challenge any obedience by virtue of this text. This text shows that obedience is due to civil rulers in cases wherein they have power to command and does not call for it any farther. In other words, they have power within their own jurisdiction to command and no further. 
Now take that, for example, um, and apply the same thought to elders in the church. Elders in the church have a declarative authority. And it doesn't mean that declarative authority doesn't mean I can declare whatever I want to, right? Uh, Noel, as soon as the church is out, I want you to go grab my lunch. Wait, while you're out, the car needs a little wash and wax, and I'm going to need my dry cleaning on Monday. So do what I'm telling you to do. Submit to your elders. Right? It's not going to go good for you. I can't give an account for joy. If you're not going to, I need to be joyful, Noel, about what you're doing. You need to do that. Right? <laughs> That's, that's ridiculous. And I have no, we have a declarative authority only. And what is the scope of our declarative authority? To declare anything I want to? No, it's to declare the word of God, to apply the word of God, to preach the word of God. That's the only authority that's been given us. We can apply the word of God. We have the authority of admitting the keys, right? Of admitting members into the church. We have the authority with the church to administer church discipline. But every single bit of that in accord with what the word of God says according to our consciences as we seek to serve him. Uh, we have no authority outside of that, right? So there is no absolutist form of elder authority to which you are required to submit. It's ridiculous. In the very same way, there is no absolutist uh, requirement of obedience to civil authority, right? It works in the same way. And that's really important. I, I don't know why there is that disconnect in people's minds and it may be because for so many years, we've grown up thinking in those ways, like told those things, you got to obey the civil authority with absolutely no understanding or no qualification. And you hear that enough, and maybe it just gets entrenched, ingrained in us that God appointed that civil authority and I'm to obey them, you know. Um, same thing, God appointed elder authority, God appointed husbands in their positions of authority. And that doesn't mean an absolute authority in the case of elders or husbands. Um, there are very biblical reasons for why we would resist obeying um, a usurping or pretending authority, okay? And that's an authority that doesn't accord with God's ordinance. Um, listen to a Congregationalist minister, Jonathan Todd, 1749. I want you to hear from their own words, right? So you're not, this is just not crazy stuff that Pastor Mark is coming up with, right? We're in a long, a very, very long history of traditional understanding, traditional thinking in a line with the reformers on this subject. And it's important for us to see that because we need to apply that in our own day. All right, Jonathan Todd, 1749, the doctrine of obedience and subjection to magistrates has doubtless been carried too far by those who allow the people to make no resistance nor self-defense under the most arbitrary and illegal abuses of power, but insist that they tamely sit still and see their laws, their liberties, their religion and properties invaded under a notion of authority and power. See what he's saying, right? Doubtless, when the whole head is sick and the foundations of his state are removed, when the governing, when, when he says when the foundations of his state are removed, what he's talking about there is the law of God. The law of God, the, the objective basis for morality. When that's gone, right, the foundations of his state are removed. When the governing powers become tyrannical then and arbitrary and usurp a power that was never given to them and evidently go counter to the instructions of the great Lord by whom they rule, the law of self-defense is in force amongst the people and they may judge that God is to be obeyed rather than men. All right? Very, very important. We could spend uh, several Sunday school classes unpacking that statement. Really important. This Romans 13 understanding of government, in particular, a government's responsibility on behalf of God to the governed, led to a doctrine of Christian resistance. That active, not passive, that active resistance to civil authority is sometimes justified in the face of injustice or oppression. That is, you know, essentially a definition of Christian resistance. That sometimes Christian resistance is necessary, it's justified in the face of injustice or oppression. That, and the, the, the colonists, uh, reformers even, but the colonists in particular, really careful to make the distinction between that Christian resistance and bare lawlessness or violence, right? It's not the, the riots in the streets in Portland or in Minneapolis and burning down buildings and, you know, 
uh, attacking police officers. And like, it's not that kind of lawlessness. And they wanted to be really careful that Christian resistance didn't, um, on that end of the extreme, devolve into that kind of lawlessness. This is um, to be in accord with God's law, in accord with what God's word says. Um, it's to be measured, it's to be thoughtful, it's to be wise, it's to be godly. And we'll talk about what that looks like. Okay? And not unnecessary violence. Like there, there, were, there were circumstances or situations during that period leading up to the American Revolution where um, violence was unnecessary. Oftentimes, violence was caused first, like we're going to talk briefly about the, the uh, Boston Massacre, where violence was led by British troops on American soil, um, but uh, it shouldn't be that we just run amok with violence um, in resisting. Uh, we'll have to look at what that entails um, in a little while. All right, so that first the, um, is dealing with that... Um, the, the, the American Revolution didn't take place in neglect of the Scriptures. Um, the American Revolution largely was fought on the basis of the Scriptures, okay? And that view of Romans 13. Second, that doctrine of Christian resistance was being formed, organized, before the Reformation. So um, the American Revolution, and even in our day today, we are in a long line, a long line of thought along these along this premise, um, for developing a Christian theology. This, we're not Johnny-come-latelys to, um, to this thought or these ideas. The American colonists didn't just sort of come up with this um, out of thin air as a means to justify revolution. That's not what the uh, American Revolution was. Uh, this has been, these thoughts, these ideas, have, were formed across the pond before the Reformation. And we saw that. That's one of the reasons we took that little historical tour is to show you that those thoughts have been developed before the Reformation, during the Reformation, after the Reformation. Um, it was consolidated, as we talked about, synthesized during that period of the Reformation, clarified under the Reformed thought or secular thought of John Locke. And so by the time we get to the American Revolution, a patriot clergy in the colonies um, had already formed a theology of political resistance, and were zealous to defend it. And you can imagine the reason why, right? Here's the context of their application of this theology. They fled. They were under severe persecution in Europe. And there, there are Christian ministers, Christians being murdered by civil authority, by Catholic ecclesial authority, for hundreds of years, but in particular around that period of Reformation, persecution is just inflamed in Europe. They do all that they can to resist there, including fleeing into the woods and holding services in private. Uh, because if uh, the government came in, the dragoons came into the Huguenot, into a Huguenot worship service, they would kill the pastor and run all the Christians out of the place. Um, so they were under severe persecution. They fled those places, first fleeing to Britain where parliamentary rule was being established. Then under policies of, against nonconformists or under Anglican state church policies, they fled England under persecution and came finally to the United States. And now in the United States, uh, when there is a hint <laughs> of that kind of persecution or that kind of tyranny taking a foothold in the colonies, now they are all about um, stomping the camel's nose under the tent, okay? And that's essentially the way they saw it. Um, as soon as the camel stuck his nose under the tent, they're stomping on that because they don't want to fight the entire camel in the tent. You, does that make sense, that little picture, that illustration? Uh, they don't want to fight the camel inside the tent. They want to keep the camel outside the tent. And they know from their own experience, what a camel in the tent looks like in Europe, okay? That's the context in which they're developing or, or enforcing, if you will, a theology of Christian resistance by the time they get to the colonies. By the time we get to the American Revolution, uh, they've already developed this uh, thought. Um, our circumstances today are little different, and we can draw that connection, but I would submit to you that the time of stomping the camel's nose is long gone. The camel is inside the tent. Um, and so now you're dealing with what is, what is different uh, in our day than their day is that we are caught 
battling some 1,200 pound beast. Um, and we're trying to, to do that without a lot of help, you know, and not many Christians willing to get out of their, you know, sleeping bags to stand up and fight the, fight the camel. Um, so we're, in that sense, we are Johnny come lately to that, to that party. We'll talk about it. Okay. I want you to hear from their own words. Colonists had fled persecution, absolutism. They had fled tyranny. They established themselves with uh, the unalienable rights that they were given by God in the colonies. And then they resisted when there was any encroachment to those rights. Um, They zealously guarded those rights because they knew what tyranny looked like. Um, They expected government to uphold and protect those rights, not challenge those rights. They expected their governments to be God's ministers for good. And they erected government here on that basis, okay? Uh, For example, Cotton and Increase Mather helped to overthrow Governor uh, Edmund Andros in 1689. We don't have time to get into the details of that little interaction But um, they essentially, the crown, appointed a governor, Andros, in the New England colonies. He came here immediately, um, rejected, canceled all the charters that had been given by the king, set up his, you could call it a royal rule over, I think it was five colonies, and began to tax them double and triple what they had been taxed. And weren't using those taxes in the colonies, he was sending them back to parliament. And so it wasn't long under that kind of tyranny before, in this case, Cotton and Increase Mather, if you're used to hearing those names, um, rose up uh, with many others in help and overtook uh, the government uh, there in uh, Massachusetts and took Edmund Andros prisoner and put him on a boat back to England. (laughs) Uh, That was part of it. They weren't going to allow, they simply were not going to allow that kind of tyranny on this side of the pond that resembled the kind of tyranny they fled from on that side of the pond. Do you see? Um, Something as simple as the Sugar Act. There's something called the Sugar Act in uh, 1764, the Stamp Act, 1765. Um, Encroachment on the part of civil authority, leads to more encroachment, okay? And that is just a, an axiomatic uh, rule. Um, the nose of the camel under the tent, it won't be long before the entire camel is there. And they experienced that in Europe. Uh, they began to experience the same thing here. Um, the Sugar Tax, the Sugar Act, 1764, the Stamp Act, 1765, the colonists saw that as a violation of the Magna Carta. Thank you, brother. Saw that as a violation of the charters that had been given to them by the king. And so listen to the words. This is an assembly from Boston, made up largely of Boston area pastors. Listen to what they said. But what still heightens our apprehensions is that those unexpected proceedings may be preparatory to new taxations upon us. Okay? In other words... The sugar tax of 1764 is the nose under the tent. And what's their concern? That that's the the beginnings of new taxes against them, okay? And it may not sound so bad. What's the big deal? And the way that was presented to them by parliament in England was, what's the big deal, right? What we're trying to do, we have uh, British troops on American soil during the American, uh, the um, French Indian Wars, during the Seven Years Wars. And so Britain wanting to replenish its Financial base decided to pass a little, just a simple little sugar tax on the colonies to help us pay for the troops that we put there to protect them. That was the argument, right? So just a simple tax. We feared that those unexpected proceedings, this tax, may be preparatory for new taxations upon us. For if our trade may be taxed, then why not our lands, right? They have no basis for taxation, So why not tax our lands? Why not the produce of our lands and everything we possess or make use of? This, we apprehend, annihilates our character right to govern and tax ourselves. It strikes at our British privileges as we have uh, never forfeited them. We hold in common with our fellow subjects who are natives of Britain. If taxes are laid upon us in any shape without ever having legal representation where where they are laid, are we not reduced from the character of free subjects and put under tribute? And essentially is what they're saying, that um, just like uh, Israel, when they defeated a country, put them under tribute, and they had to pay taxes. That's essentially what par- Parliament is doing to the colonies, and they recognized it. 
it was um, behind the scenes. To everyone else, it's a simple little tax. What are, you, what are you getting all worked up about? But behind the scenes, Grenville, who was um, a parliament MP at the time, uh, an MP um, in charge of parliament, was selling something far different on that side of the pond. Um, what the purpose was behind the, the scenes was to gain control over the colonies, to increase political tro- control over the colonies, to have greater power over the colonies. Royalists wanted a revolution. They wanted to have all of the charters thrown out and a complete reorganization of the colonies. You even had MPs um, in English Parliament um, arguing against the tax themselves, British citizens arguing against taxing the colonies. Um, Isaac Barr, William Pitt, um, Pitt said this in Parliament, I rejoice that America has resisted. These millions of people, talking about the colonies in, in the U.S., so dead to all the feelings of liberty as so voluntarily to submit themselves to be slaves would have been fit instruments to make slaves of the rest of us. In other words, like this just, they start there and that spreads. There is no end of tyranny. He rejoiced that America resisted that encroachment of civil authority because it stopped the spread of tyranny, if that makes sense. Also, the Stamp Act allowed for Parliament. Uh, the Stamp Act, interesting, wanted to tax any, any writing that was produced in the colonies was taxed because they, put a, they could only use a paper that was stamped by British government. So that paper was taxed and it was only doled out to those who are going to, like you wouldn't get paper if you're going to write against the government, uh, it was taxed. And it was an infringement upon freedom of the press, free speech, uh, those kinds of thoughts. Not only that, but part of the Stamp Act allowed for British Parliament to appoint bishops in the colonies. Now, what does that tell you is going to happen when the whole camel comes rushing in under the tent? They're going to have a state church in the colonies just like they have a state church in England. And the colonists saw that. George Whitfield, meeting with New England ministers in 1764, listen to this. This was 1764. The Stamp Act was passed in 1765, right? So George Whitfield seeing this. George Whitfield said, I cannot in good conscience leave the town without acquainting you with a secret. My heart bleeds for America. Oh, poor New England. There is a deep laid plot against both your civil and religious liberties, and they will be lost. Your golden days are at an end. You have nothing but trouble before you. My information comes from the best authority in Great Britain. I was allowed to speak of the affair in general, but enjoined not to mention particulars. As Whitfield, before the Stamp Act was passed, telling them, This will mean the end of your civil liberties, right? The end of your religious liberties. A simple tax, right? The way that they would try to sell it. Exactly what the colonists fear. Listen to Andrew Elliott, a Boston pastor, and then we'll close. Where men are grossly of a contrary character and pervert their power to tyrannical purposes, submission if it can be avoided, is so far from being a duty that it is a crime. See the point that he's making? It is an offense against the state of which we are members and those whose happiness we ought to prefer to our chief joy. It is an offense against mankind whose rights we meanly betray. You saw, I have just examples come to mind, American Revolution, um, World War I, World War II, those who stood by and um, proffered a, um, uh, a strategy of appeasement, right? Those who stood by and wanted to appease Hitler and appease Hitler and appease Hitler, they are betraying people they should be defending, right? It ends up being a betrayal. Um, whose rights we meanly betray. Um, look at those countries that Hitler took on a weekend, right? Uh, and try to put forward a strategy of appeasement when they're under tyranny and oppression now because they weren't standing against it. Make sense? Um, that's the thought process here. It is, uh, Andrew Elliott, it is, it is an offense against God who is good to all and how he has appointed governments for the welfare and happiness and not the destruction of his creatures. Became the policy of the British to station troops among the colonies in support of government. Led to the Boston Massacre of 1770, the burning of the HMS Gatsby in 1772, the Intolerable Acts of 1774. By 1775, British 
ships were stationed off the colonies, randomly firing shots into civilian areas. And the colonists were expected to take this, you know. Um, American clergy uh, then began to conceive of resistance, Christian resistance, as a matter of self-defense. Here's the point I want to make. Um, you could say, you could say that it all got started with a simple little tax on sugar. <laughs> Just one, a little simple, right? That if they hadn't, hadn't taken a stand on that particular tax, we might all be speaking with a British accent today. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know um, tyranny and oppression, we might all be Anglican. <laughs> It wasn't a, just a simple tax on sugar. We, we tend to think that way, don't we? In our country, these laws that have been passed and the things that have been done, we've got the whole camel in our tent. And it's happened while there has been conservative majorities in our government, while there was the moral majority, remember those guys back in the 80s, um, putting out TV ads and putting up billboards. And in other words, it's happened in the face of, sort of, so to speak, in the face of the church, with um, little, if any, uh, true biblical Christian resistance. And I don't mean by that that we should have a revolution back then. But there is a way that the church, I think, is responsible to um, resist and to do what they can in this dark world with the tools that the Lord has given them uh, to put at their disposal. I think there should be a voice. Like, let, if you can imagine all those that profess to be a part of the moral majority in the 80s, if every one of those people was a rabid evangelist, was out preaching the gospel, turning from your sin and putting faith in Jesus Christ or you're going to hell, if all of them had been that kind, what would that have looked like? It would have, it would have been transformational. Um, but that's not what the church did, right? The church, in many cases, Christians, professing Christians, capitulate. Now, we can't be those who capitulate. Um, We'll look at the rest of some of this uh, next week, and I want to get to begin to uh, sort of apply some of these principles for us. Sorry today I rambled on, didn't have time for questions, but uh, hopefully we'll have more time for questions next week. If you have questions, don't hesitate to come talk to me, and I'll be happy to help you through it. All right. And I, real I realize, too, that these things are difficult. They're not easy to think through that way, and it's going to take some meditation on our part. When we begin to apply it, I think it's going to make a little more sense. So as you're working through that, as you're struggling through that in your own mind, um, don't hesitate to talk openly about it. Let's work through those things together. I want us to, to get it. Uh, it's important that we get it, but I recognize that they're difficult. So don't hesitate to ask, okay? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our time. Thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for uh, clear instructions uh, from your word. Thank you for uh, godly men and women who have gone before us, uh, godly instructors that you have gifted to the church to help us understand these things. And I pray, Lord, that um, these would take root in our heart and mind, that we would be faithful to you in the generation in which you have appointed us and faithful to you with the gospel in the midst of this wicked and perverse generation that we might honor your name, your cause, hallow you, esteem you more than men, and would um, stand for what you stand for and stand opposed to those things you oppose for your glory. Help us, Lord, by your spirit to do just that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, let's uh, plan for to be...